This is our very first Christmas Day service that we've run here at Bright Church. So uh, I'm, I don't know whether that's a good thing or a bad thing now that I've said it publicly. But anyway, um, it is our, our first Christmas Day service and I'm glad that you could be here. And maybe you, you came along because someone said, come on, it's Christmas. <laughs> You know, and you just said, all right, like, let's, let's do it. And you came along on Christmas Day. But I really believe that uh, God's going to speak to you today. And uh, it's good for God to speak to us at Christmas. Amen. Um, so I wanted to say, firstly, a huge thank you to everybody who actually did come today. Because many of you, your homes are trashed right now. And, and there is wrapping paper everywhere. And it's a, it's a total mess. And despite the mess, you said, I will go to church. Jesus, uh, we are celebrating your birthday. So yes, I, I will go to church. So, so God said to me a very, very special blessing for everyone who came in person today. And it is this. For the next 24 hours, you can eat whatever you want and you will not put on even one gram. And that is, come on. All right. Thank you. I can't guarantee that. Um, actually, I'll tell you what, I'll make one guarantee. If you start eating at lunchtime and don't stop, it's only one meal. Okay? So, so that is my gift to you and, and you're welcome. Uh, we, we have Christmas plans like you guys do and uh, we're, we're excited to, to get to them. I'll tell you one um, group of people that could not wait for Christmas uh, is, is my kids. I, I remember when I was a kid uh, growing up, Christmas seems to take forever. And, and I was, and you know what one of the saddest, most depressing days was? Boxing Day. Because it's as far as I could get from, from Christmas Day again and getting the presents. And I would be totally disappointed. But at least we had a calendar. And, uh, you know, you'd, you'd look at the days and you could mark them off. And we're getting closer and it's about to happen. And it's, you know, it's only a month away. And then you trigger the chocolate calendar. And then you're right on top of the details, you know, because every chocolate, you're counting it down, right? And you know you're a little bit closer closer. And I, you know, personally, um, I, I wish that all of the things that God did, just like Christmas Day, I wish we could just put it on a calendar, just square it away, just lock it in there. One of the things I've discovered is that God doesn't use calendars. Well, maybe he does, but he's got his own version and he doesn't share it with any of us. You know, God doesn't seem to use a calendar. You know what I've discovered about God is that God's plans are always revealed in his promises. God's plans are revealed in His promises, but they're just not always attached to a calendar. They're not always attached to a specific time and a date. One of the ways that we find God's promises is in His Word. That's why it's so good that you've got a, a Bible and you should read this and learn about what God wants to say to you. What are the promises that He's put in His Word? Do you know that God has made promises to every single one of us. And if we read this and we know what they are, then we can spiritually contend for those things that God says that we can have. And so one of the ways that we find God's promises are in His Word. The other place that we find God's promises is in the Spirit. And what I mean by that is, you know, God comes in three parts, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit speaks to us and, you know, maybe that sounds strange to you and that's not been your experience, but I believe that the Spirit of God speaks to us and that He reveals things to us, promises for us, promises for our future. And, you know, if we read the Word and we listen to God, we discover some of those things. You know, the language of the Spirit of God is dreams and visions. It says in the last days, you know, the prophecy says that God will pour out His Spirit on all flesh and people will have dreams and people will have visions. Dreams and visions is the language of the Spirit of God. And so sometimes we see things that God has spoken or hear things that God has promised, but then we have to just wait for them to come along. I tell you, I told you, one of the the people um, that absolutely hates waiting is, is my daughter, Eliana. I discovered, because we bought presents for them some, some time ago, and we put them in our cupboard in a hiding spot. And I discovered recently that she's been regularly going to that hiding spot to lift the box on her, um, you know, new shoes. And she's looking in on them and, and seeing that they're there and just, you know, maybe, I don't know, like reassuring herself that they haven't disappeared. They're not actually going anywhere. 
And then what we should have done, because we didn't do this, we should have wrapped them earlier, but we didn't. But when you wrap the presents, you take them and then you put them under a tree and then the kids come out and they can't, well, maybe they do rip a little bit, I don't know, but they come and they see those gifts that are under the tree and it's the evidence that they're going to receive something in the future. You know, like they see the presence there and it's absolutely clear that one day they're going to open those. At least they've got a calendar that they can work towards, but there's some evidence there. There's a, there's a promise there that's going to be revealed at some point. Whenever we talk about promises, promises are always future tense. They're always about good things. And I'll tell you something about God is that when He makes a promise, it's always for your good. It's always for my good. And we call that hope. And the Bible says that we should have always be ready to make a defense for the reason, for the hope that is in us. So as Christian people, as people that are followers of Jesus, one of the things that we have is hope. Hope is a faithful expectation that, that, you know what, at some point, the future is going to get better. There is a point where what I'm experiencing in my present is going to get better in the future. That's what hope really is. Who hopes that things are going to get worse? No one. Hope always thinks, hopes and believes that things are going to get better. In other words, whenever we hope, we hope for what we don't currently have. But that's where we are. Paul, the author of Romans, he said this in Romans 8 verse 24. He says, now hope that is seen is not hope. And when he says seen, he means you've got it. You've got possession of it. Hope that is seen is no longer hope because you've got it. You know, some of you, some of you were really hoping that you would get socks and undies at Christmas time because they've been wearing thin the last couple of months and Someone here, someone in this room got socks and undies for Christmas today. Someone did. Someone did. People are nodding like, yes, it was me, right? You don't have to hope for that anymore. Like, who holds the gift and says, geez, I really hope that I have this? It's like, no, you've got it. So once you've got it, you don't hope for it. That's what Paul was saying. He says, who hopes for what he sees, for what he has? But we hope for what we do not see. We wait with patience I've discovered that God's promises are often followed by a waiting season. God's promises are often followed by a waiting season. The problem is hope deferred makes the heart sick. That's the tension that we have. The space where so many of us might find ourselves. Um, That, by the way, for those that might not know, that is a scripture. Hope deferred makes the heart sick. It's out of Proverbs chapter 13, verse 8. You know, for me personally, if... If I was going to give God a gift, if I was going to buy him something, what do you get the guy that has everything? A calendar. Because he obviously doesn't have one. You know, what, what, is it, what does God need? He needs a calendar. And then if he was really nice, he would share it with me so that I would know when all of those things were coming up. But I've discovered that the, the best things in life are often worth waiting for. Amen. It doesn't matter whether it's a spouse or a house. You just, you know, the best things in life are worth waiting for. You don't marry the first person that you date. Maybe you do. I don't know. But don't just do it because you went on a date. You know, well, they said yes, so let's lock it in. Um, You know, you you don't go looking for a house and you walk into the first one and say, this is it. I want it right. Maybe you do. But just because you went there doesn't mean that you necessarily should lock that house in. I've discovered that the best things in life are worth waiting for. And waiting has its benefits. Waiting has its benefits. If we read the scriptures back in uh, Genesis chapter 3 and verse 15, it's the first mention of the gospel. And for those who wouldn't know what the gospel is, it's the coming of Jesus from heaven to earth to pay the penalty for our sins and mistakes, forgiving us so that we could have eternal life and spend eternity with Him. It's the most encouraging message that we could ever hear. And in Genesis chapter 3 and verse 15, there is the promise that a Savior will come and that He will defeat and crush our enemy, which is Satan. We call that proto-evangelium. It's the first message of the gospel. And if you're reading the scriptures for the first time, you could just skip right on by that and say, oh, that sounds nice. But it's actually the first time that we ever hear that Jesus is coming. And, And how exciting that must have been for Adam and Eve. 
that things were about to get better. But then it didn't happen in their lifetime. But I'm sure they told their kids about it. And then it didn't happen in their lifetime. And then they told generations and generations, hey, it's, it's going to get better, but all this time they're waiting. Man, when is this guy going to come? When is this guy going to show up? Along the way, God sent prophets to encourage the people of God that the promise, while tarrying, is still very real and is happening. And you have already heard this this morning, but Isaiah 7.14 says, Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. And they knew it. There was this overwhelming sense that God would be with His people and that He would defeat the enemy. At some point, He would come. And then the prophets, when they spoke this word, they must have thought, well, since we're all talking about it, maybe it's getting closer. Uh-uh, uh-uh, uh-uh. Over 700 years before Gabriel would come to Mary and speak to her. Another 700 years. Isn't that amazing? And so God has made this promise, but they're just waiting for it. And this is what it says in Luke chapter 1, verse 31. You will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. You would think at that point that scholars would be so excited about the fact that Jesus came. The religious people of the day must have been amped to say the least, they had waited long enough. They had waited all of this time just for this event to happen. They were more educated about this event than anyone. They understood the scriptures and what they were all about. You would think that they were so excited about it. But as you go and start to read on the story, they rejected him. Imagine waiting that long only to reject the promise when it comes. And you sort of think, why would anyone do that? Well, the longer you wait, the harder it is to believe. The longer you wait, the harder it is to believe. And people are believing for things all the time, even in this room right now. Some of you, I, I, I don't know what God has promised to you, because some of these things you're going to find in the Word, and some of these things God is going to speak to you, and maybe some of these things you just really hope that they are true. It takes discernment to hear the voice of God and know when he's speaking and when he's not. But there would be people here that say, I don't um, have the gift of singleness and I really want to get married one day. And, and that's my hope for my future. But today you are single. And that's the way that things are. There would be other people that would know someone. And we prayed for them evidently today for people that are sick in their body. And they believe that God has made certain promises that people can take authority over sickness. And, and, and they're and they believing that even today, right now, that their health is going to get better. But the reality is that they're still sick. There would be people that are believing that the financial situation that they're in, that it's going to get better because they're being faithful and they believe that God has made promises and I don't know what he said about that, but the reality is, is that today is really tough because things are very tight. And they're in that season that I think that every one of us find ourselves in, which is that we're waiting. Sometimes the problem with waiting is, is that our expectation only is, is only ever raised to the level of our previous experience. So... At some point in our life, we believed that things could get better, but then somewhere along the line, we say, well, maybe it's not going to get better, and maybe we shouldn't expect too much. Maybe what I'm asking from God is too much. Maybe I should only ever expect what I have seen, what's already there, what's already in my past, what's already been present. So what do you do when you only accept what you've previously seen? You just settle. You settle. We went shopping yesterday, and I was trying to find a gift um, for myself. <laughs> it's true. And I, I, I'm looking for something specific, and I couldn't find it. And then we went into um, a few different shops, and I said, look, I can't find what I want, so let's just go back and get that other thing. You know, we'll, we'll go back and we'll get that. 
And so we went, we got it, we bought it. We went all the way to Doncaster, right? We did our shopping. And then we left and we drove out. And we're going all the way out to like Churnside Park. And I walk into the shops and there is the thing that I wanted. <laughs> yeah, just not far from my home. We went to Doncaster, couldn't get it. Come back to Churnside Park, there it is. And so I got it and I suddenly had this moment where I thought, why did I settle <laughs> when I could have had this? And then I checked my bank account and I thought, I could have this too. <laughs> and Sarah wasn't with me, so I bought it <laughs> for myself. And I thought, if she loves me, I'll keep it. And today, I opened it. So I have it. So I have it all, you know. But it doesn't always work out that way with life because sometimes when you settle for less than what was promised, you don't get that do-over. You can't always do it in life. I wish it worked as easy as Christmas shopping, but it doesn't. So, so, so you just settle for something else, something less than what you thought God was going to give to you. I am certain that even... This morning, there are people that are waiting on promises from God and they've never seen anything in their lives like what has been promised. There would be people here today that are still waiting to fall pregnant and have a child. There would be people here today hoping, especially around the holiday season, that their mental health will improve, but it hasn't been their personal experience. There would be people here today thinking, I've got this lunch that's after, you know, church this morning and it's going to be awkward because there's still that relationship issue that hasn't quite been sorted out and what they're wanting is relationship restoration but it's just not the present reality and there might be hope that it could get better and hope that things might get better but the present reality is that it isn't but there's one thing that I've learned about Christmas and it's this is that Christmas is the proof that our waiting doesn't diminish God's ability Christmas is proof that our waiting doesn't diminish God's ability. He made a promise to Adam and Eve, the Garden of Eden, guys, right back at the beginning. And then think about all the generations and generations and generations and generations of people that waited and waited and waited. They must have come to a point where they think, maybe it's too, the reason he's not doing it, it's too hard for him. And I know that sounds crazy for me to say it out loud when I put it to you like that. But anyone that settles for less than what God has promised to them is doing that exact same thing. Maybe the reason that God is not doing it is because it's too difficult, it's too hard, and there's this temptation to want to settle. What I'm saying to you is that Christmas is the proof that time doesn't diminish His capacity, His power, or His ability in any way or form. He is just as powerful now as He ever was. And when you read the Scriptures and read the most amazing stories you've ever read, it's the same God. The same God that did everything we read about in here is the same God that's in this room right now. The same God that breathed out stars. The same God that has the limited, unlimited capacity to do everything that you, what, hope for. Galatians 4.4 4 says this, But when the fullness of time had come, Ha! I hate those three words. The fullness of time, what does that even mean? Nobody knows. <laughs> None of us. The fullness of time, it's like God knows what that means, but we don't. Wouldn't it be cool if you could put that in the calendar? You just mark it off. Oh, what's this date? Oh, that's the fullness of time. And then it all happens. <laughs> but it, it doesn't work like that. When the fullness of time had come, God sent forth His Son at the exact right moment. God has very precise timing. He never makes mistakes. He knows exactly what He's doing. And I started thinking about this, and I know that He knows exactly what He's doing, but I thought, God, honestly, timing. I feel like you could do better sometimes. You know. I was thinking about this story. 
I was thinking about when Gabriel showed up to Mary and told her that she was going to have Jesus. And you know what I was thinking? Think about all the times that Mary and Joseph could have been found together. You know, like, I bet they went for a walk one day. It's a beautiful day. Do you want to go for a walk? Gabriel. He goes, look, just thought I'd catch you both at the same time. (laughs) Right? Think about all the times that they were together. And Gabriel could have just said, just while I got the two of you, I want to let you know something real special that's about to happen. And Joseph would have been like, oh, fair enough, cool. <laughs> Great, so glad I was here for this. But God sent Gabriel at a time when Mary was by herself. So then she went to Joseph and said, I'm having God's baby. Ha! He could have spoken to them at the same time. And I started to think about this. And I started to realize I have no idea why God does what He does. And I don't know much about his timing and how he plans things. Often in retrospect, I'm like, aha, but at the time, I don't really get it. I don't really understand it. But then Gabriel comes to Mary and she says to this thing that Gabriel had spoken to her, which is you're going to have God's baby. She says, how is this going to happen? Because she'd taken, you know, high school biology and she understood how it works. So So she's like, how is this going to happen? Good question. Very good question. It's interesting that she doesn't follow up with, when will this happen? Just so I can prepare people appropriately. She says, how will this happen? And Gabriel says, oh, the Holy Spirit will overshadow you. There's another one of those words that contains the promises of God and the complexities and impossibilities of things that we don't quite fully fathom or understand. But he says, oh, he'll just overshadow you. To which Mary replies, okay. Let it be done according to your word. She's just immediately on board with it. I'm reading this story and I'm thinking, just because you haven't received the promise doesn't mean God can't deliver it. I'm reading this story and I'm thinking no one had ever seen God in flesh, let alone at the time believed that 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 could happen, that God would physically become flesh. And yet the Word of God says that. It said that He became, the Word became flesh and dwelt amongst us. It means Jesus became physical and dwelt amongst us. No one expected that this was going to happen, but He did it. And sometimes God does things that we don't expect at timings that we would never choose. And yet He does it according to His plan and His purpose. He takes His own counsel. It's according to His will. I read this story and I think it's crazy what happened. The the King of all kings, God stepping down from heaven and coming to earth in the form of Jesus, born in a manger. Are you kidding me? Do you remember how that story happened? Mary and Joseph arrived just as all the rooms were filled. Why couldn't have God sent them just a week earlier? Why couldn't they just have the baby a week later? Do Do you see what I'm saying? It's like these seemingly inconvenient things that seem to be happening outside of God. And yet when I read the story, it's everything that God wanted for this story. Born in obscurity, in an inn, are you kidding me? Where animals are fed and who should be invited to this very special event? Should it be the priests of the day, the religious people of the day? Oh no, no, no. Who's invited? The shepherds. I don't know if you know this, but shepherds were ceremonially unclean because they handled the animals. So they might be kept at arm's distance from the religious people. Don't you think it's fascinating that God invited the unclean people to the birth of the King of all kings? Are you kidding me? Who should be invited to this? The priests, the high priests, no. The Magi, people, Gentiles, people from outside of Israel and they travel and they get to witness what some people had hoped for all the way along because the people that hoped for it didn't have the faith to receive it at that moment. 
God does things that are out of the box. I've discovered that you can't, you, you, you can't box Him in. And you may not have what you hope for, but just because you don't have it doesn't mean that God is unable to deliver it. And I make you this promise today. If God has spoken to you, if there are promises in His Word, He's good, He's faithful, He's true, He follows through, His Word never returns void. He has never failed once in the history of ever and you are not an exception to the rule. If He's made you promises just as sure as Christmas happened and that was an impossibility that no one dreamed could happen, just because no one had ever seen it, don't think that just because you haven't seen it yet, it could never happen in your future. We have a God that is able to do abundantly above what we think, or what we hope or what we imagine. Christmas is proof that our waiting, it never diminishes God's ability. He is just as powerful now as the day He made you promises. He's just as powerful now as the day that Jesus was born. He deals in the realm of, of impossibility. I want you to close your eyes for a minute. I'm going to finish this message very quick. I think there are so many people in here today that are waiting for something to break, for something to give. It could be a relationship. It could be your health. Maybe it is that you want to have a baby and that hasn't happened for you yet. There are, there are so many things that you could be waiting for right now. And I tell you, God is just as powerful today as He has ever been. If you're waiting on something right now, I wanna pray that you're encouraged while you wait because waiting has its benefits. He knows exactly what He's doing and He's never made a mistake. If you're here and you're, you're contending for something today, I'd like to stand with you while you contend. So if you're praying, believing, expecting something, can you raise your hand right now and say, that's me, I'm, I'm hoping for things I have not yet seen. I've never seen what I've asked God presently for. Amen. Yeah, there are, I just don't wanna lose anyone because there's a lot of people that are believing and have hope here today. But I'm, I, I'm gonna contend for you in this moment. So if that's you, why don't you join with me and raise your hand and say, yeah, I'm believing for something. Father, for every single person in this room that's contending for a promise that has not yet been realized, as sure as Christmas Day happened, as sure as Jesus came from heaven to earth and we'd never seen it, I believe that you can do something new in the next season of the lives of people that are here right now. They may have never seen it, but today we're getting rid of that and we're not lowering our expectations to, to only believe what we've seen in our past. We lift up our eyes today to see that You are the Lord God Almighty. You are able to do above what we can think or imagine. And I pray for everyone who's currently standing and waiting on a promise that's come from You. God, I pray for a breakthrough in their life right now. I pray, God, for a breakthrough in the Name of Jesus. I pray, God, that the season of waiting, just because in it from our own perspective, you, you would expect us to contend for these things and to pray for it. Lord, we trust Your timing, but today we contend for the promises that have not yet been realised. And I pray that while we celebrate Christmas, all day today, we would remember that You always do things for the first time. And today, as Christmas is not the only exception, You did it then and You can do it now. We pray and believe these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Just stay right where you are. If you close your eyes for one minute, if you're here today, you've never given your life to Jesus. But today as you listen to the gospel and you realize that Jesus came because He loves you, He's paid the penalty for all your mistakes and wants a relationship with you, but you've never asked Him into your life to become Lord of your life. But today you want to make a decision to follow Jesus. Why don't you raise your hand and say, that's me. I want to make a decision to follow Jesus. I'm, I'm giving my life to Him right now. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. All right, here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna pray one prayer all together so the people that are praying it don't have to say it on their own. You ready? Dear Jesus, thank You that You love me, that You died on the cross for my sins. I receive You today as my Lord and Saviour and I choose to follow You every day for the rest of my life. In Jesus' Name, 
and everyone said amen and gave God. Hey, well, thanks so much for watching. We hope you enjoyed the video today. Like, subscribe and share if you think this content will be helpful for you or others. If you did give your life to Jesus today, please let us know. We would love to walk that journey with you. You can check us out at brightchurch.com and we look forward to seeing you either in person at a service or online. We hope to see you soon.